I'm going to continue reading Mystery on Mackinac Island. The next chapter is called Questions Without Answers. Things that they are discovering that don't have any answers yet. So it makes a good mystery. When the three boys reached the remains of the old dock, Rusty's eyes widened in amazement. It's humongous, he exclaimed. Was it built for the British warships to land at? Greg just doubled up laughing. No, Hunter answered, keeping his face straight. The British came from their ships in little boats. This dock was built much later for big lake steamers, but it hasn't been used in ages. Though the great pilings looked strong, most of the framework and the planks had rotted. The boys picked their way around holes all the way to the end where the crystal water was at least 20 feet deep. In another minute, the boys were diving in, climbing out, and going in and again, and again and again with huge splashes. After a while, they got hungry. They sat on the end of the dock, sharing their sandwiches with Greg. As they ate, Rusty was reading his guidebook, and Greg was peppering, question, peppering Hunter with questions. Where had he and the redhead been so far? What had they seen? Where were they going next? Hunter gave short answers or just said, I don't know. But Greg asked if they had seen anything unusual. It was Rusty who answered. Yeah, that wreck of a house on the battlefield. It's not cared for like the buildings downtown or the fort. Why don't they fix that up? Oh, Hunter told them, it's just too far gone to repair. They don't tear it down though because it's a landmark. And it's haunted, Greg chimed in. Oh, you're crazy, laughed Rusty. No, honest, it is haunted, Greg insisted. It's haunted by the ghosts of soldiers killed in the battle. A couple of guys in the village tried to sleep there once to try and win a bet. They scrammed when they saw a soldier coming down the stairs with his scalp gone. Man, oh man, said Rusty, that's a place we need to explore. As soon as they had finished eating, the boys chased each other into the water again. Under the dock, they found a huge floating log, which they tugged out into the open. They rode it and paddled and tried to stand on it the way the loggers used to. Every once in a while, Hunter whispered to Rusty that they ought to get on with their bicycle hunt, but Rusty begged to stay here a little longer. It was late afternoon when they finally dressed. Rusty wanted to go back on the center road so he could go to the ghost house. Greg said it was too hot to ride up that hill, and it would be easier to go back along the west shore. No, Hunter decided we'll go the other way so Rusty can see the east shore and look at Arch Rock from the lake. It's funny, Rusty said laughing. We go east or west to go home. They followed the road northwest to Pine, Pine Point. After making the sharp turn there, Rusty called attention to the narrow graveled track that disappeared into the woods. That looks mysterious, he announced. Maybe we ought to look into it. Why? Greg asked. Hunter said to the redhead, you've got a runaway imagination. That goes to a private home. Islanders or summer people, Rusty asked. Neither, really. It's a retired professor named Witzerick and his daughter. They, they come as soon as the ice is gone and they stay till the lake freezes again. I've seen Miss Witzerick a couple times at the grocery store, but I've never seen her father. He writes books. Ooh, he's a hermit, Rusty exclaimed. What's a hermit? Greg asked eagerly. A guy who doesn't want people snooping around, Rusty said. Greg looked disappointed. At Arch Rock, they stopped only for a minute and went into town. Hunter reminded Rusty that they needed to go to the Grand Hotel. What for? Greg asked. With a solemn face, Rusty answered, We're thinking of buying the joint. That got Greg to be quiet for a few minutes. The bike shop was at the back of the imposing hotel. Stopping there, Hunter said, Rusty, you and Greg can stay out here with the bikes, okay? Sure, you go in and ask the question. As Hunter walked away, he heard Greg ask Rusty, What question? Greg, the redhead declared, you are as full of questions as a TV quiz show. In short time, Hunter came out and winked at his partner. They never saw him, he reported, so now we know. Never saw who? Greg asked. Hunter told the boy to go home. He and Rusty were going back to the beacon light, but Greg made no move to follow them, but stayed where he was, t where he was until they were out of sight. As soon as it was thief, Rusty said, do you really think the clubfoot guy is the thief? Sure looks like it. We saw him riding a rental rented bike, but no rental shops have seen him. They couldn't miss a guy like that with, with a miss a guy with a shoe like that. 
Hunter was thoughtful. Then he said, you know, Rusty, I get an uncomfortable feeling around that kid, Greg. Me too, Rusty agreed. Bad vibes. If he tags along tomorrow, we're going to give him the slip. At the beacon light, they saw a big athletic man coming out from the, onto the porch. Hey, Dad, Rusty called. Have I got a lot to tell you. And this is Hunter. Rusty's dad had strong features with blue eyes like his son's and sandy gray hair. He came down and shook Hunter's hand. I'm glad to meet you, Hunter, he said. You're sure giving Rusty a whale of a time. Hunter, not knowing what to say, returned the handshake and smiled. I was hoping to see you, the man went on. Tomorrow is Sunday, and our whole bunch is taking a charter boat trip to the Snow Islands. You can have the day off, or you can come along as our guest. Rusty begged him to do that, but Hunter said he had lots of other things he needed to do. Well then, Mr. Hammergren said, we want to have dinner. You, we want you to have dinner with us on Tuesday then. We'll invite Jancy and her aunt, and then we'll all go to the movies. The invitation Hunter accepted. Suddenly, he realized what a lot the Hammergrens were doing for him. He knew his grandfather would want him to show hospitality, too. He spoke up quickly before he could change his mind. After the movies, he said, could Rusty come and spend the night with me in my grandfather's cabin? Rusty let out a whoop, and his father, after asking a few questions, said he could go. Hunter picked up his bicycle. While you're at the snows, he promised, I'll work on the mystery. I'll see you later. He bought some groceries and a pane of glass and went home. Approaching the cabin, he felt a tingle of fear. He wondered if there'd been more vandalism while he was away all day. To his relief, everything was all right. As he repaired the window and got his supper, he made plans for the next day. Sunday was the biggest tourist day, and he was going to make the most out of it. He decided to do a stakeout at Arch Rock down by the lake. Then he stepped outside into the soft twilight. A few birds were calling, but they sounded sleepy. The air smelled of pine and cedar. He strode down the path, listening to the whisperings of the forest, the stillness alive with the sound of birds and animals and insects. He would never experience all of that if he lived in the village. By the time he reached the road, it was deep dusk. By turning back, before turning back, he glanced across the empty house. Against the night sky, it was only a shabby cardboard outline. Then a shadow detached itself from the side of the house and scurried through the meadow grass toward the trees. Hunter stiffened and stared. What in the world? It was too solid for a ghost. It didn't leap like a deer. Too broad for a dog. He wondered, what could it be? I'll read the rest in part two.